All right. Uh, welcome one and all. Cheers to you uh, on this beautiful uh, Sunday, a very hopeful uh, Sunday. And uh, we have the most hopeful uh, and celebratory of all wines uh, to uh, drink, uh, to toast with, to learn all about uh, together on this gorgeous day. Thank you for resisting uh, the urge uh, to celebrate outside, or at the very least, hopefully, you know, you have a, a laptop or monitor set up um, on a patio by a fire pit, what have you. But um, I'm thrilled to have you all uh, with us. Um, I was worried, uh, having uh, set the mandate for today's lesson, that uh, I jinxed the whole thing, um, or that uh, the results would uh, trickle in at an even slower pace uh, than they did uh, already. But um, at the very least, uh, we all have something to toast to uh, this Sunday, and uh, that, is, that is worth celebrating. And um, I'm excited to give you all a better sense of uh, exactly what is in uh, your toasting glass. Um, about that glass, um, you know, if you have champagne flutes, that's okay. But if you have regular wine glasses for your champagne, please use those. Uh, it is just a better uh, glass for champagne. The flute, uh, aesthetically pleasing. You get to see, you know, the bubbles uh, rise uh, ethereally, um, you know, up, you know, kind of like that longer arc. Uh, but the flute itself really adds nothing uh, for the sake of uh, the enjoyment of the wine. And, you know, uh, you can make a strong argument that it detracts from the enjoyment of the wine because you have this kind of narrow uh, little opening. And ultimately what that does with something like champagne is it delivers all the CO2 and none of uh, the other, you know, kind of more charming um, scents uh, to your uh, olfactory bulb. So uh, you just get this like, you know, blinding, um, fierce um, kind of burst of, uh, you know, that fizz um, and nothing else. Um, so, you know, if you're trying out the flutes, more power to you, but uh, if you have the option, um, make like, uh, you know, your friends at a Gatsby garden party, use a coupe or better yet, just use a good wine glass, uh, use a good wine glass, you know, uh, your greatest uh, champagne uh, makers, your greatest um, appreciators of champagne uh, will insist on a proper glass uh, for their wine. And uh, we'll talk more about that as we go forward. Um, on the subject of temperature, obviously you want your champagne cold. Um, you know, I know this is a matter of personal preference, um, but I will say, you know, leave it out a little bit. Um, the more the champagne uh, comes up in temp, uh, the sturdier your champagne is, uh, the more expressive it will become as it raises a few degrees. So maybe go closer to 50 degrees in temp, as opposed to that, you know, freezer, uh, you know, 40 degree mark uh, that most people uh, aim for. Or, you know, better yet, if you're happy with where your wine's at, you know, let it out a little longer and play around uh, with, you know, uh, a little more exposure and see how it evolves um, over time. I think you'll be presently surprised. Um, but at any rate, uh, I am uh, equally thrilled uh, this Sunday to have uh, none other than our very own uh, Joan, um, operations guru extraordinaire, uh, joining us uh, to administer the chat um, and, uh, you know, just keep everyone in line. Uh, she does that um, at the office um, through both restaurants, and she's going to do that uh, for the chat form and uh, the hangouts today. Thank you, Joan. Excited to be here. You're the best. Um, uh, don't worry, Zoe, we'll be coming back. She uh, is, I don't know where the hell, Zoe's somewhere in West Virginia. I don't know if that Zoe knows where she is in West Virginia, but um, she uh, has earned a break. Um, for the sake of wines, we sold uh, some mini bottles um, and we're gonna move through those first. Uh, if you have a couple glasses available, as always, I encourage you to taste those wines side by side. Uh, we sold through the bulk of our minis, so I'm gonna talk you through the tasting on those. I've to tasted both those wines, but. I won't be able to enjoy them uh, with you myself because I had to give up those bottles um, for the sake of the masses because uh, your appetite for champagne uh, became insatiable um, over the last couple of days. Uh, I was very excited about it, but uh, we're gonna start with a dosage trial uh, with uh, Le Brun uh, Sirene. I tasted alongside the Margon, uh, Margaine demi sec and then uh, move into the uh, Gatinois versus the Guy Lamangier. Um, tasting those side by side. And if you do have a couple glasses uh, so they can move from one to the next, uh, I think tasting that way uh, is hugely illuminating. Um, otherwise, I think it's less important today of all days, um, you know, 
what you're drinking uh, than the mere fact that you are drinking, that you are celebrating, um, that you continue to sustain, uh, sustain this amazing uh, virtual community and that we are all uh, celebrating uh, together. So uh, cheers to everyone. Uh, without further ado, uh, honor to have you all with us um, uh, to uh, celebrate uh, wine perfectly suited uh, for this moment, that is champagne. Uh, Want to give big ups, major props to Todd Daubert, uh, one of our uh, regular listeners who ran the gamut on the champagnes for the sake of this lesson. Uh, Todd, I hope you're not uh, popping the cork on all of those today, uh, but I am absolutely uh, honored that you chose to uh, provision in such style uh, with us, and I, I hope you enjoy them all. Um, Napoleon uh, is said to have remarked, in victory, you deserve champagne. Uh, in defeat, you need it. Uh, I am grateful um, uh, that uh, we are celebrating uh, in victory uh, as opposed to defeat uh, today. Uh, we have a lot to celebrate. Um, you know, first and foremost, a peaceful uh, election pro uh, kind of process, no violence um, at the polls uh, to speak in the midst of this, you know, very tumultuous uh, national moment. Uh, I am very hopeful uh, for uh, a Biden presidency. And I wanted to uh, kick things off with a, a bit of verse that Joe himself uh, quoted in his uh, Democratic um, National Committee nomination uh, speech. This is from uh, an Irish, a contemporary Irish bard uh, named Seamus Heaney. This is from um, a, a translation of a uh, Greek tragedy. Uh, Seamus calls it the cure at Troy. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave, but then once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that a farther shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracles and cures and healing wells. Call miracle self-healing, the utter self-revealing, double take of feeling. If there's fire on the mountain and lightning and storm and a God speaks from the sky, that means someone is hearing the outcry and the birth cry of new life at its term. It means once in a lifetime that justice can rise up and hope and, and, hope and history rhyme. Um, I know I usually wait till uh, the uh, end of a lesson uh, to offer up a proper toast, but uh, I wanted to kick things off with uh, a toast to that. Um, uh, to uh, hope and history uh, rhyming. Uh, cheers to you all. Uh, cheers to uh, the election result and uh, the hope of a new presidency. Mm. Now you may wonder why it is that I have uh, red wine in the glass here um, as opposed to the usual sparkling. And, uh, that is because um, Champagne has been uh, a hugely celebrated and famous winemaking region for uh, well over a thousand years, but for much of its history, uh, it owed its fame to wines that were still and looked more like this than what is likely currently uh, in your glass. Uh, that's kind of fascinating to me. So um, Champagne, uh, the region, uh, exists at the crossroads of Europe, um, kind of uh, sandwiched between uh, east-west and north-south trade routes. So uh, working your way uh, through France, um, and you can get a better sense of this, uh, you know, looking uh, at a larger map, but working your way through France, you have uh, trade, traditional trade routes, um, and a, a portion of them uh, run from north uh, to south, um, which is to say um, from uh, the Mediterranean uh, up to uh, Flanders, from Switzerland uh, up to Flanders, and then a portion of them run east to west, and that is from essentially Paris uh, through to the Rhineland. Uh, and Germany and Champagne exists at the cross-section uh, of those two regions. Um, the name uh, derives from uh, the Latin Campania, so uh, you might notice Champagne and the uh, Italian region Campania um, share that uh, in common. They are fertile plains, uh, very close to national capitals. Um, Champagne has a, a gift and a curse being at the crossroads of these trade routes, the crossroads of history, you know, its unique geographic position uh, has been a, a boon, uh, but it has equally, um, you know, been problematic. Um, and over the course of a thousand years, um, you know, it has been, you know, the center of, uh, you know, various um, battles uh, over uh, the continent, um, particularly over uh, France. Uh, it was kind of northern extremists of the Roman Empire. 
Um, it takes, the country takes its name uh, from Frankish tribes, uh, Germanic tribes who settled there in the uh, latter days of uh, the waning of the Roman Empire. But uh, you have, you know, Mongol hordes such as uh, Attila the Hun, um, you know, who wasn't repulsed until the fifth century. You have, you know, French civil wars erupting, you know, every few hundred years. Um, have the uh, Hundred Years War between the English and French, um, which goes on for, you know, if you guessed it, actually well over a hundred years. And then uh, into the modern era, World War I and World War II um, were fought uh, on the chalky soils of Champagne. Uh, nonetheless, these successive conflicts merely interrupted the growth of the wine trade. Um, you know, they continued to uh, cultivate the vine and develop uh, wine in spite of um, these frequent and you know, painful uh, interruptions. Um, it should be said uh, that uh, the kind of wine trade didn't really blossom there um, until the seventh, eighth century. Uh, it grew up with the church, uh, but as it did grow up, um, the most famous kind of early French kings uh, from the 14th to the 16th century, um, they were drinking uh, champagne and celebrating its merits. Uh, French kings have been historically throned at Reims, um, and that dates back to um, Clovis, um, the most famous early Frankish king, um, who promised to convert to Christianity um, uh, if he won a battle over rival uh, Germanic tribes. And uh, he, uh, of course, um, you know, uh, seized the day and triumphed on the battlefield. And, you know, if you make that kind of triumph, um, you know, you have to follow through on the whole baptismal thing. Uh, so he did. Uh, he was baptized at Rims and... Uh, since that time, um, at the tail end of the 5th century, uh, every major French king um, from uh, the 5th century on um, has claimed Reims uh, as the uh, site of their ascension uh, to the throne. And um, the proximity of Reims to these uh, historic vineyards in Champagne um, has created a natural association between um, the wines of Champagne um, and celebration. And you know, that is something uh, that we are uh, marking uh, ourselves um, through uh, to uh, the modern era. Um, now, I, I mentioned briefly that I'm drinking a, a red wine. And, you know, that is because, you know, until uh, really um, talking like the, the 17th, 18th century, um, Champagne was a still wine. Um, the wines of the region uh, made their way um, down uh, the Seine. Um, Paris was the most important uh, domestic market. Um, and uh, the wines were largely um, pale uh, in color, luminous. Um, one of my favorite growers, actually the gentleman uh, who makes this particular wine, uh, he says that uh, we grow grapes on the same soils as the vine growers of Chablis. And you can see um, this particular producer, uh, Dumont, is in the Aube, uh, in the Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the southern uh, end, uh, the bottom edge of that map. And his region is closer to Chablis, um, and its soils are very chalky. All of the Champagne region uh, exists in the heart of the Paris basin, but different types of chalk and the Kimmeridgian soils here are most famously the source of Chablis steely Chardonnays. But uh, in this corner of the Champagne region, uh, you see light ethereal uh, Pinot Noir. And uh, Bernard Dumont, um, one of three brothers uh, who uh, works the vines here, uh, his family has worked uh, this land for over two centuries. He says that we produce white wine from white grapes in Chablis, uh, but in his region, we produce white wine from red grapes. Um, I love that notion. And, um, you know, if any of you are drinking this um, by happenstance at home, you know, I'd love to hear what you think of it. Um, it is very much a wine that drinks like uh, a white uh, in spite of its red color. It has more of this kind of uh, bright, um, you know, kind of like tart fruit of a dark rosé uh, as opposed to um, a, a fuller body um, red, um, as I think, you know, we typically uh, think of uh, a red wine, but it's hugely enjoyable um, nonetheless. And, you know, uh, that freshness, uh, that vibrance um, is something that uh, historically uh, people that love champagne uh, would celebrate uh, for the sake of what ended up uh, in the glass. Um, now, uh, I'm going to share a, a bit of a timeline. It's not the most, um, you know, kind of uh, compelling uh, timeline or graphic uh, in the world, but uh, it has a lot to say about the history of the region. So um, if uh, Champagne didn't really exist as a sparkling wine um, until, you know, uh, the 17th and 18th century, you know, how did it come to pass that, you know, what we are drinking today is the most famous 
uh, fizz in the world. Uh, well, it came to pass not through the ages of uh, a monk, um, you know, uh, working in isolation um, at uh, an abbey um, and seeing stars, as it were, but uh, through the ages of English traders. Um, so uh, this is a series of champagne first and big up to the folks at uh, Guild Psalm uh, for compiling this rather boring listening, looking, but uh, hugely informative. Uh, timeline. Um, and the earliest recorded mention of Champagne um, is uh, not uh, in French, but in English uh, in 1662. Um, and Samuel Pippis, uh, it should be said, um, who wrote the most famous uh, English diary uh, documenting uh, his work as an uh, English bureaucrat around the time of uh, the uh, Restoration, um, he documents his love of Champagne as a fizzy wine, but well before the French were enjoying it. Uh, as fizz. Uh, it just so happens that English merchants were bringing in uh, chilled wines like this and even lighter red wines uh, like I have in my glass, and they were adding them uh, to their own bottles. Now, at this time, English glass was vastly stronger than French glass, and that is because the English in their gas furnaces, um, in their kind of glass furnaces, it should be said, uh, had embraced coal which fires at a much higher temperature and can produce much stronger glass. Uh, whereas the French were still um, you know, firing their furnaces uh, with wood. And because of that, uh, the English um, could uh, add this French juice um, back to their stronger uh, English glass bottles. Um, they could add raisins, add molasses, add sugar, add honey uh, to prime for a second fermentation uh, in the bottle and create something that was fizzy. And it was a bit of a fad. Um, you know, at the time. So it was considered less a, a serious age-worthy wine um, as it was, you know, a fun, you know, kind of a sporting class uh, fad of sorts. So, you know, uh, this was something that, you know, kind of wealthy, um, you know, English and then uh, Frenchmen um, did uh, for diversion uh, more than anything else. Um, and it should be said that the most serious wine merchants of the time actually looked down on fizzy uh, champagne. They thought that fizzy champagne was actually debasing uh, the reputation of their preferred wine. And uh, I love this image. This is the first, um, it's called uh, the oyster lunch, but this is the first um, image of champagne as a sparkling wine um, that, uh, you know, exists on record. And uh, it's at Versailles or some, you know, haughty French palace. But, um, you know, this looks like a fun, you know, kind of party. If, if you're one of the dudes, I don't know if it would be you know, fun for anyone other than a, a wealthy, you know, French gentleman of leisure. But, um, you know, if you fall in that demographic, it looks like the place to be on that particular afternoon. Um, it should be said that these wines were much sweeter uh, than the wines that we uh, enjoy uh, today. And uh, production was much less regularized. So if the English invented champagne, uh, the French, uh, it should be said, uh, perfected uh, champagne. And they did that over time uh, throughout um, the uh, uh, 19th century through a, a series of innovations that ultimately allowed them to regularize what had been, um, you know, a very difficult, you know, set of production practices. So, you know, you read this early literature about uh, champagne and people talk about losing, you know, half of their product to breakage of, um, you know, the uh, inferior uh, French bottles uh, that they were using. Um, you know, they talk about, you know, uh, bottles that were variously too fizzy or not fizzy enough and had to be added back to uh, the vat. So it was hugely unreliable. Um, it took, um, you know, kind of mass mechanization um, and uh, the growth of what the French call the Grand Mark, the great houses uh, of the 19th century to create a product um, that we know today uh, as champagne. And I'm going to share one more boring, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, timeline for you, um, chronicling the many innovations that make champagne what it is today. But, um, uh, you know, you can see beginning in the, the uh, 18th century, you have the greatest houses of champagne, uh, Vu Clicquot first among them, um, which was presided over by the widow Clicquot, um, who deserves much more credit than the monk uh, who typically gets it uh, for making champagne what we know today, along with her German cellar master, Antoine Müller. Now you notice, now mo must notice that, you know, many of the greatest names uh, in champagne are actually German, uh, not French. And that's because uh, a lot of the proudest 
aristocratic families uh, in Champagne, the French ones who owned the land and the larger estates, uh, didn't want to be associated with the wine trade. So they hired, um, you know, kind of industrious Germans to do it for them. Uh, the Germans were so industrious that they took over these states. And, uh, you know, names like uh, Krug, Heidsick, Bollinger, um, they went off on their own. And, um, you know, so the, the French, you know, essentially uh, invited the Germans into the market and the Germans ran with it uh, as they are wont to do. But um, the widow Clico and Antoine Mueller invented a process called rumage. And uh, the rumage process allowed them to add sugar to the bottle um, and prime a secondary fermentation to create fizz uh, in the wine. So uh, it allowed them essentially to mechanize what formerly, you know, had been a, a somewhat kind of arbitrary and uncertain uh, process uh, for the sake of creating uh, champagne. Uh, and uh, it allowed them to create something that was vastly more consistent uh, than it formerly had been and create something that, you know, they could produce at a scale that would satisfy foreign markets. Um, and first, uh, you know, the English, but then uh, the Russians and then the Americans uh, came to uh, adore this product uh, that was uh, champagne. And uh, you can see here, um, you know, the riddling wrecks. And uh, these are uh, the wrecks in uh, the uh, underground cellars drug out into the famously chalky soils of uh, Champagne. Um, and uh, you can see here that uh, the bottles on end are bringing the little bit of sediment that is left over after the secondary fermentation process that happens in the Champagne bottles um, and leaves uh, a bit of spent yeast uh, in the mix. And in order to clarify uh, the wine, um, what the widow Clicquot and her German cellar master realized is that uh, they had to uh, rack their wines, leave them on end, turn them each slowly um, over time. Um, and uh, as they did so, and as I'm spilling my Pellegrino, um, you know, they could uh, work the sediment into the end of the bottle and then ultimately uh, freeze uh, the neck of the bottles. And, you know, there wasn't necessarily one person that was, you know, uh, making these innovations. It was a series of innovations um, that really occurred over time um, that, you know, kind of standardized uh, what once was a, a much more kind of, uh, you know, individualized, um, you know, kind of set of, um, you know, practices um, from seller to seller. But, you know, the houses, the great houses, the individual producers talked um, communicated and over time, uh, they realized that they had this dead yeast and if they plunge it into a uh, frozen saltwater bath, you get the frozen sediment in the neck of the bottle. If you plucked um, the crown cap, uh, they would have used cork on the 19th century, but today we use a crown cap. Uh, then it expelled the leftover sediment and you were left with something uh, that was crystal clear in the glass. Now, at that point, you have uh, a little headspace um, in the wine. And at that point, very often you have a wine that is searingly acidic. Because in Champagne, we are at the uh, far northern limit of, um, you know, kind of wine production. So we're, you know, situated uh, throughout the region uh, between the 49th and the 50th parallel. People commonly say that, you know, wine production, uh, grape growing thrives between the 30th and the 50th parallel. Here we're at the northern extremis. You know, we're practically at Paris. Uh, it should be said that, you know, um, the uh, kind of border uh, between uh, the U.S. and Canada uh, sits between the 49th and 50th parallels uh, as well. So you're pretty far uh, north uh, here, um, you know, and the only reason that the climate isn't more marginal than it is is because of the influence of the jet stream, but um, they lean into this marginality um, and you're getting grapes that are racy, um, you know, at harvest and wines that are really bright and acid driven, but that makes for a great busy product. The problem being that after you disgorge, after you 86 your segment, um, you know, you are left something which very often needs a bit of corrective. Um, and that comes in the form of what is called dosage. And that brings us um, to our first um, kind of bottle off here. Uh, Joan, did we get any comments about uh, the red wine uh, from folks uh, drinking at home, you know, for better or worse? You know, I think, you know, for people who think they know Pinot, this is definitely not, you know, your Russian River Valley Pinot. This is, you know, uh, clearly a wine that is going to thrive you know, as something fizzy and maybe not something that, you know, you would want to, you know, drink on its own, you know, in the same way that you would a typical red. I didn't get a ton of comments on it, but I do have some questions if that's okay at this time. Um, Heidi yep. specifically yep. wanted to know what you 
and her were drinking yesterday. I think Jessica answered it. It was the, it, but if you, if you wouldn't mind sharing what you were drinking with Heidi yesterday. Yeah, so we were drinking Heidi, uh, the uh, Vimart, uh, that's uh, B-I-L-M-A-R-T, uh, Grand Cellier. Um, and uh, that particular offering um, is from a region of uh, Champagne called the Montan de Rims. Um, and we are um, gonna talk over, you know, the uh, various differences between the qualified growths here. Um, but, you know, just skipping ahead a little bit for the sake of that bottle, because it is pretty fucking delicious. Um, that comes from a primary crew village, which is a village which is called Ri uh, La Montagne. Uh, Bimart is one of the greatest winemakers um, working today, a small grower producer, um, which is to say that he owns all the vineyards that he is working with. Um, and he's famous um, in his village um, within the region for aging his wines in oak. Um, a lot of the more quote unquote classic producers actually work entirely in stainless steel because they want a wine of purity that takes that tastes solely of, you know, the famously chalky soils of the region. Vimart wants breadth, he wants weight, he wants, you know, kind of exotic spice out of his wines. Um, but they work because they maintain this tension between that, you know, opulence, but also this, you know, really kind of uh, linearity, uh, this bright salinity, um, that champagne should always have the sense of focus um, as well. And it's that, you know, breadth combined you know, with that, you know, focus that, you know, makes those wines uh, great. And, you know, that, you know, champagne um, really embodies um, at its best. And, you know, these are wines that, you know, they are electrifying, you know, they are buoyant. Um, it's the kind of wine that, you know, you can, you know, just drink and easily appreciate, you know, you don't have to understand champagne as a wine to enjoy it. You can just understand it as something, you know, fun and diverting. Um, you know, I hope that, you know, through the course of this lesson, you know, you will come to understand it better uh, as a wine as well, because lurking underneath the effervescence, you know, there is something that speaks uniquely to this uh, place that is at the crossroads of European history that has endured, you know, centuries upon centuries of warfare, but, you know, nonetheless uh, persisted in making, you know, these transcendentally uh, delicious wines. What else you have, Jim? I've got an immediate question on what you just said. Um, can you explain what grower champagne is? Yes, so uh, that's a, a great question. So um, we're gonna start off with a couple grower champagnes for the sake of our dosage trial. Um, I use air quotes. Um, so um, we have two wines side by side here. I have the Margaine Demisec. Demisec um, is essentially half dry. Um, you at home, um, if you ordered the uh, Grand Cru Battle Royale, also have, um, or, or ordered the Dosage Trial, it should be said, um, have a Grand Cru from Guy La Mangier. Um, uh, Guy um, is a grower in the Cote de Blanc. Um, this comes from a grower in the Montagne de Rennes. I will talk over those distinctions, but um, these are both wines that are heavily based on Chardonnay, and they both come from grower producers. Now, um, grower producer um, is a distinction from uh, the kind of large recolon manipulant. So um, there are a lot of uh, really fun, um, you know, kind of uh, acronyms uh, for the sake of champagne, which makes it a little bit uh, like uh, Washington, D.C. Um, there are, you know, just two, uh, two letters strong, though, so it's not quite as insufferable. But um, the bulk of uh, producers um, in the region are what's called negociant manipulant. Um, uh, so they purchase fruit, the great houses, um, so, you know, uh, about 60% uh, of the wines that come out of Champagne come from these larger houses that purchase grapes from uh, a, a huge number of smaller growers um, that control about 90% of the vineyard acreage. Um, now, starting in the 30s, a lot of these growers, you know, started to realize that they could make more money. They essentially got forced into it uh, because the houses started uh, to pay less and less for their product, uh, and there was a glut of grapes. But um, increasingly, these smaller growers have started to realize that um, they can uh, control the means of their own production and create more value themselves by making their own wines, as opposed to selling their fruit to these larger houses. So grower producer refers to someone that is both growing their own grapes and making their own wines, whereas the predominant modality in Champagne historically were larger houses buying fruit from a bunch of different vineyards that they didn't own. So that is the distinction here. And uh, we have two grower producers that we're celebrating. Um, Margaine, one of my favorite, um, uh, they date back uh, several generations, uh, strong Margaine. This is a demi-sec and it should be said that um, that's all about that dosage. Dosage is a sweetening liquid. It can be either concentrated grape must um, or it can be um, uh, kind of 
uh, essentially wine that has a bit of cane sugar added to it. Um, and uh, you add a little bit of that after disgorgement. And this sounds like, um, you know, kind of the worst type of, uh, you know, kind of artificial intervention, um, you know, when it comes to uh, winemaking. But it should be said um, that it's hugely significant, hugely important for the sake of giving balance um, to the wines. So, you know, adding this dosage gives balance in a way that is impossible um, if you don't add sugar. And, you know, you can think of sugar and acid as opposing forces. If you add more acid, the sugar becomes less apparent. If you add more sugar, the acid is muted. So if those two are in balance, then everything else kind of has a way to shine. And I want to taste these two wines. Um, and, you know, I'd love to hear from those of you at home. You know, uh, this sits, uh, and we can measure these things empirically, and producers do. So this sits, the margain, at 30 grams per liter residual sugar. Um, uh, our, you know, kind of uh, palates biologically are configured um, to perceive uh, sugar, you know, above the threshold of, you know, 8 to 10 grams per liter in a wine as acidic as champagne. Uh, the other wine that we have against this, the Guy Lamondier, is sitting at, you know, 6 to 7 grams per liter of residual sugar. Now, I ask you for those at home, you know, which of these wines, you know, not only do you prefer, but, you know, how do you differentiate them? For me, what I love about the Margain is, you know, there's a subtle perception of sweetness, but the quality of fruit is very different in it. So uh, I think, you know, it doesn't taste cloyingly sweet, but it does taste much riper in terms of the quality of fruit. Um, and, you know, that's kind of a welcome change for it. And then it will necessarily go with different types of dishes than a bone dry champagne will. And it's become hugely fascinating in the wine, kind of fashionable, it should be said, in the wine world to double down on uh, dryness, um, to say, you know, like we say with beers, you know, you thought your IPA was hoppy, try my IPA. It's even like, you know, 10 times as hoppier. Um, in champagne, they've, they've gone kind of a similar route. And, you know, people have say, you know, um, this dosage is, is, is artificial, you know? Um, we should be making, you know, our greatest wine should be non-dosé. They should have no dosage at all. The problem being that, you know, those wines can be severe. You know, they can be, you know, kind of um, harsh uh, on the palate. They can be, you know, kind of um, aggressive, you know, lemon head like um, in, their, in their own way. And adding a bit of sugar, you know, will illuminate other aspects of the wine, will allow the fruit to shine. And, you know, there should be a sense of balance that, you know, transcends the dosage. I don't think you should have a a sense of the sweetness in the wine, it should just, you know, have elegance and balance. So, you know, the greatest sweet wines, you know, uh, be it in champagne or otherwise, are the ones ultimately I find that don't taste sweet. Um, Joan, does anyone have comments about uh, these two wines uh, side by side? Yes, there were some comments. Um, I think someone had mentioned that it smells like freesia. I think it's- it Smells like what? Is that right? Um, but I bet, let me double check. I think so. Um, not a ton of comments, but I still have more questions if that's okay. Can you yeah. clarify um, what Blanc de Noir is? Absolutely. Um, you know, I put the cart before the horse on a lot of the, you know, champagne vocabulary um, for the sake of, you know, that history lesson um, that, you know, uh, hopefully, um, you know, some of you tuned in for. Uh, there may or may not be a test later, but um, Blanc de Blanc, Blanc de Noir. Um, it gets to the question, you know, what are we dealing with for the sake of our source material here in Champagne? So we have two wines uh, here. You can imagine, um, you know, there's a uh, imaginary half bottle here that is the Guy uh, Lamanger. Um, these are both Chardonnay based wines. Chardonnay in Champagne um, gives, you know, bright, uh, chalky persistence, um, elegance uh, to the mix. Uh, historically, um, you know, or, or kind of in the modern era, um, there is a Champagne Troika. Now, historically, I talked about how uh, Pinot Noir was a dominant grape in the region, but now uh, it is very much um, a uh, kind of a, a, a three, um, you know, kind of a legged stool of sorts. And the Troika is Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. Now, uh, there are four other grapes um, allowable in the mix that no one talks about. Um, Pinot Gris, um, which is also called Fromantou, um, Pinot Blanc, uh, Pinot Meslier, and Arbane. Um, there are some growers that are trying to revive um, these lesser known uh, grape varietals, um, uh, but uh, the big three are the most important. And when people talk about Blanc de Blanc, they're talking about a white wine made from white grapes. Um, the Margain, technically not a Blanc de Blanc, it's actually uh, closer to, um, it's actually like 88-12 Chardonnay 
uh, Pinot Noir. So technically it's not Blanc de Blanc, but it's Blanc de Blanc-ish. Um, uh, the Guy Limonier, uh, which is sitting uh, to its right, um, is actually Blanc de Blanc, 100% Chardonnay um, all the time. Um, and these different grapes thrive in different locations within Champagne. And that's something we'll talk about uh, for the sake of uh, the second flight, and I'll have uh, imaginary bottles uh, once more. But Chardonnay uh, thrives in the Cote de Blanc. You know, it's not the biggest mental leap there, uh, but Chardonnay loves east facing sites in Champagne, and it loves the hardest, chalkiest, uh, kind of uh, thinnest uh, soils uh, throughout the region. Now, Pinot Noir, um, it gives Champagnes their structure, their body, their broad shouldered, um, kind of fuller fruitedness. Um, and it tends to thrive on these south facing sites with slightly heavier uh, clay soils. Um, uh, historic villages like Ai, which we'll get to uh, shortly, um, the base of the Montan de Rems, and then the north facing sites on the northern end of the Montan de Rems is a place where Pinot Noir uh, will thrive. And then Pinot Meunier is, is kind of the least well known of the bunch, but um, it uh, is an early ripener, uh, is later to um, bud and flower, earlier to ripen than, than Pinot Noir. So it does very well um, in the Val de Marne, um, uh, which uh, has uh, kind of uh, even heavier uh, clay soils. Um, and uh, in the Val de Marne, um, it should be said um, that, you know, you also, uh, being in a, a valley, um, get, you know, a greater danger of uh, frost um, as well. And the fact that it buds a little later and ripens a little earlier, um, you know, helps mitigate that, some of that danger. So um, you can see uh, the, um, the Val de Marne here. This is the Marne River uh, snaking its way um, toward uh, Paris. And uh, yes, this is the very famous uh, Marne River, uh, the site of um, trench warfare throughout uh, World War One, um, you know, I think you hear those names and, you know, it becomes very abstract, but, you know, the French and the Germans were essentially fighting uh, over uh, Champagne um, during World War One and then uh, later uh, throughout uh, World War Two. But uh, this is Pinot Meunier country, uh, largely. And then uh, this kind of horseshoe shaped region here is the Montan de Rems. You can see Rems itself, um, ascension site of uh, French kings once upon a time. But the northern edge of this mountain, um, the south facing slopes here, Pinot country. Uh, a couple east facing sites here. Um, uh, that's actually where Margain is on one of those east facing villages are Chard country um, because they have slightly chalkier soils and Chardonnay loves those east facing vineyards. And then this is the Cote de Blanc. Um, the Aube, uh, which is where my red came from earlier, Pinot country, Kimmerogene soils closer to Chablis, which is just off the map to the south. Uh, right here. Uh, when we're talking Blanc de Blanc, or Blanc de Noir rather, um, we are essentially talking a white wine made from red grapes. So, you know, we've talked about this previously, but the color in wine comes from the grape skins themselves. And uh, for the sake of, um, you know, the greatest, um, you know, kind of uh, sparkling white wines from Champagne, uh, they are direct pressed. Um, and the Blanc de Noirs are direct pressed, which is to say the grape clusters are brought whole, um, from harvested by hand, typically from the vineyard to the press and the presses um, in Champagne. Uh, there's a famous uh, Champagne press that is a, a very shallow basket press. Um, and uh, they use that shallow press so there's not a lot of contact between the juice and the skins um, as the juice runs off um, the grapes. Um, and uh, this shallow basket press allows them to work with um, red grapes like Pinot Noir, like Pinot Meunier, um, and uh, to make uh, elegant, um, you know, crystal clear um, white wines um, for the sake of their Blanc de Noir. So uh, Blanc de Noir would just be a essentially a white wine uh, made entirely uh, from red grapes, which are um, pressed directly um, off the skins. And I'm going to share an image with you all as well of a couple of gentlemen um, working uh, the champagne press because, you know, um, pneumatic presses, bladder presses, um, which are large and cylindrical and, and much more soulless appearing, um, have, you know, taken over um, winemaking throughout other regions, but the Champagne Press, you know, kind of has this psychological romantic hold um, over the region to this day and is still used uh, to this day. And essentially what happens here, um, it's a very kind of, um, you know, kind of broad, uh, shallow press. And you see that uh, element there on the top that, you know, kind of folds down and then uh, presses uh, through a screw. And this is essentially Roman technology, um, you know, through to the modern era. And uh, the juice itself flows between these uh, slats um, in the press um, and out into a uh, fermentation vessel. Um, 
any other questions? Uh, yeah, I've got a bunch actually, Bill. Awesome. Um, does anyone make non-bubbly white wine from red grapes? Um, yeah, we just had one. Uh, so we had, uh, this is the um, Pinot Noir um, from the AUB and it goes under a different label. So um, they, they can't call it champagne as such. And it should be said linguistically, um, I find this fascinating. Um, in French, uh, Le Champagne um, with a capital C and the masculine refers to the region. La Champagne with a lowercase c and the feminine refers to the wine. Um, uh, but uh, at any rate, um, you can't call um, still wines from the region. And there are both still whites and reds, but this is a still red. You can't call them champagne. They go under the name Coteau Champenois. Uh, to distinguish them from the fizzy wines because uh, the Champenois beginning in the er kind of late 19th century, they started, you know, rigorously protecting their brand. Um, and they wanted to make sure that no one was debasing their name, debasing their product by calling their wines, sparkling wines from outside of Champagne uh, by, uh, you know, um, their um, name and associating, you know, these inferior brands with theirs. Um, they were, you know, hugely, you know, kind of forward thinking uh, about protecting uh, their brand, um, I think, uh, that way. And, you know, you really see the beginning, um, you know, kind of of uh, designations of origin um, in their efforts to uh, protect, um, you know, kind of the reputation of the wines of the region uh, starting in the late 19th century. Um, can you talk a little bit about major labels versus grower champagne? Someone noted that when they visited Champagne, this region seemed to deviate from the other big wine regions in France about Terrier. Moet, for example, seemed to pride itself on being a blend from something like over a hundred vineyards not grown by them. Yeah, that's a, that's a really, you know, astute uh, point. And it, it should be said that you know, traditionally, Champagne has always been a blend. This notion of single vineyard wines, you know, has, you know, kind of, um, you know, kind of monopolized our, you know, bandwidth for the sets, that for the, the sake of prestige cuvées. And I think, you know, we have this Burgundian notion that the greatest wines in the world are, are the ones that are, you know, derived from a single site. Um, well, you know, not all single sites are capable of carrying a tune any more than, you know, soloists, you know, are capable of, you know, singing a cappella. You know, they're great choirs too. You know, they sound a little different than, you know, your, your singular soloist, soloist, but, you know, they're equally, um, you know, profound and have their own rights. And, um, you know, the reason they did that historically in Champagne was because you have this recipe that encompasses different grapes that do well on different sites. And because you're in a very marginal climate, from one year to the next, you know, maybe you have a better Chardonnay harvest, maybe you have a better Pinot harvest, um, and you want to correct for that. And, you know, further in Champagne, they tend to keep reserve wines. So not only is Moet, um, or Moet, um, uh, because it was a German name, actually, originally, um, uh, not only are they, um, you know, kind of blending different sites, but they're typically blending different vintages as well. And that's all about consistency in what is historically a marginal climate. Now, climate change has changed that, you know, to some extent, better viticultural practices have changed that, and they're still able to ripen their wines more reliably, but Champagne is still a very acid-driven uh, wine. And, you know, until we raise another, you know, two to three degrees Celsius, it always uh, will be. Um, but, you know, many of the greatest wines in, in the region, um, you know, are blends. And, you know, much of the great work done in Champagne is done in the cellar by blenders. And, you know, uh, the, the people earning the most money in that Moet, uh, you know, um, you know, Hennessy, you know, kind of, uh, you know, hierarchy, they're the people doing the blending. They're the people at the end of the day tasting 100 different tanks who can say astutely, you know, I want some of that, less of that, a little more of that, and, you know, that is going to be your prestige cuvee. You know, those are the people, um, you know, ultimately that, you know, are pulling down, you know, the, you know, crazy luxury brand money because, you know, they are the ones creating, um, you know, uh, the brand and, you know, ensuring consistency from one year to the next. Now, um, it should be said that, you know, we're celebrating smaller producers, grower producers. That's not to say that the bigger houses aren't um, making great wines. Actually, within the last 10 years in particular, they've made huge strides um, in terms of the quality of a lot of their entry level wines, in terms of the quality of a lot of, you know, their kind of more luxe uh, wines. But, you know, um, I get very cynical about them because the great houses, you know, they're not independently owned anymore. You know, they're owned by you know, the more Hennessy group, they're owned by these larger luxury labels. And, you know, for me, you know, there is this sense in which, you know, they do speak to a sense of place in some sense, you know, in as much as, you know, 
uh, they give you this broader arching kind of snapshot of a region or of a house style. But in terms of, you know, the great fluctuations of these smaller sites and these individual vineyards, I feel like they have, have less to say. Um, and, you know, sometimes they are more consistent than, you know, wines from the smaller houses. But, you know, for me, what I enjoy about wine is, is the highs and lows. It's not, you know, necessarily, you know, the, you know, uh, 75 degree days. I like seasons. Um, so does the, do the champagnes typically not have years on the labels? It varies. Some do, some don't. And um, I will circle back um, to that uh, very shortly. Uh, uh, Joan, I want to talk over the classification system uh, in Champagne uh, briefly. So um, the next flight that you all have kind of speaks to that whole Blanc to Blanc, Blanc to Noir uh, distinction. So um, you're going to have to imagine uh, a half bottle here. Um, and uh, that particular um, half bottle um, is from uh, an exceptional producer in the Cote de Blanc. Um, so I'm going to pull up a map of the heart of Champagne proper, um, and we're going to consider the Cote de Blanc, um, and then we're going to consider the French classification scheme because, um, you know, there are a lot of different ways to classify wine in France. Uh, in Bordeaux, they do it, you know, uh, by property. Um, so a, a chateau as such um, is first growth, second growth, etc. In Burgundy, uh, it is predicated around vineyards. In Champagne, it's based on villages. So um, on this map, I think it's kind of helpful. You can see, you know, your darkest, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, paisley uh, purple uh, rain color here, um, you know, is uh, those are your Grand Cru's. Um, and then your lighter um, uh, purple, those are your Primer Cru's. And this is classified by uh, village. And, um, you know, there is a, a group um, within Champagne um, that, you know, determines these valuations. Um, essentially from village to village and rates them on an 80 to 100 point scale. Um, the Grand Cru's sit at 100 point. The other ones sit at, you know, the Primer Cru's sit at 90 to 99. Um, it's wildly arbitrary. Historically, it was grounded in the price that these wines received. Um, you know, these classifications are, are widely ridiculed now because they're kind of overly broad. Uh, but uh, broadly speaking, in the heart of Champagne, there are 17 Grand Cru villages and 41 Primer Cru villages. Um, uh, the two wines that we have um, uh, represented here. Um, the first one um, is from uh, Le Brun uh, Serenier. It's Patrick Le Brun, uh, who formerly um, was the president of the Champagne Growers Union. Uh, he got kicked out because he got embroiled in all sorts of, um, you know, uh, French political, um, you know, scandal um, in terms of his negotiations with the larger houses around great prices, but I won't bore you with that. Um, he is based in several villages here, uh, Abizé, Cremont, and Auger. So um, he makes a Grand Cru Blanc de Blanc, and uh, it's all Chardonnay all the time from Grand Cru villages. If you say Grand Cru, it's not to say that you have to have wines from one Grand Cru village. They can be a blend of multiple Grand Cru villages. Uh, and then you have uh, the Gatinois, uh, which is a personal favorite, which is from the idyllic village of Ayi. Um, we talked over Ayi briefly. Um, Epernay um, is the kind of historic home of a lot of the most famous houses in Champagne, but Ayi um, also claims Dutz, it claims Bollinger, and it claims Gatinois. Um, Gatinois, um, lovely, uh, lovely uh, people, um, make uh, hugely elegant wines. This is Pinot country. Historically, uh, would have been, you know, still Pinot for French kings, but into the modern era is uh, Blanc de Noir. Um, the wine you're drinking here isn't quite Blanc de Noir. Um, it is uh, about, uh, you know, uh, 80, 20, 90, 10, depending on the vintage. Um, uh, but it is a non-vintage wine because they add a portion of reserve wines to the mix. Um, this is the idyllic village of Ayi, and these are the vines abutting it. Um, and uh, Gatinois um, is uh, currently run uh, by a 12th generation uh, wine maker, uh, Louis Gatinois. Um, his family has been growing grapes there since the 1600s, and they kind of trace the classic story of these smaller growers. So they you know, sold to the larger houses and still do to this day, but increasingly they reserve their grapes for wines made under their own uh, label. And um, I think it's really fun to try these two wines side by side because you get a fuller sense um, from Le Brun Sévernier and the Gatinois of, um, you know, just how a wine from all white grapes in Chardonnay and how a wine from almost all red grapes in Pinot Noir differ one to the next. And uh, it should be said as well that, you know, the wines at Le Brun Sévernier, um, they are, um, you know, kind of emblematic of this like lovely kind of 
old fashioned sensibility. So all stainless steel and uh, not oxidative in the least. I love this note from um, the importer, um, Becky Wasserman. She says, um, uh, Patrick Lebrun's uh, champagnes in their youth don't have much of the new wave um, winemaking uh, umami. Um, uh, there's saltiness, uh, there's purity um, on the lunar calendar days. Uh, that do not emphasize structure, and she's talking about tasting calendar, mind you, um, uh, based on lunar cycles. Uh, they feel incredibly free of any clutter of winemaking like archers to the rest of Champagne's artillery. I mean, what a great line, you know, and, you know, there's like that through line um, for the sake of, of these wines, and and I think, you know, that purity really comes through uh, in his wine. Now, it can be a little severe, you know, and, and, you know, these are wines that, you know, actually they benefit from time in the glass, um, you know, they benefit from aeration in the glass. You're going to lose a little bit of your bubble, um, but the wine will open up more for it. And then, you know, the Gatinois, it gives you more of that breadth, more of that flesh. And for me, I, I love the Gatinois. It gives you um, maybe even a little bit of this like ginger spice on the palate. Uh, people say, you know, kind of like a tart black cherry, um, you know, something uh, a little earthier uh, for the sake of those wines. And then uh, we didn't talk Pinot Meunier at all, but for those of you that are drinking Pinot Meunier dominant wines at home, um, we have uh, one in particular from Jose Michel. Um, um, and he's just outside of Epernay, uh, kind of in the Val de Marne. Um, but, you know, those wines um, are kind of more forwardly fruity um, and herbaceous in a really lovely way. But, you know, they can just be, you know, a little more juicy and approachable and vivacious. Um, and kind of flirty uh, and fun. Uh, whereas, you know, the, the Chardonnay is a little more angular, um, severe, and, and, and Pinot a little more, you know, uh, self, self-serious um, uh, in, in and of its own race. Um, but, uh, you know, each in their own way, um, you know, kind of uh, wonderfully terroir expressive wines. And, you know, they're enjoyable, um, you know, as diversions because they're bubbly and fun and refreshing. But, you know, there's wine uh, underneath, you know, all of that, you know, diverting uh, CO2 as well. Uh, Joan, uh, what other questions uh, do folks have here? Yeah, so I am getting some, well, some some notes about people are getting bad cheese, funky Skittles, or some of the some of the responses on the smells and tastes. Um, yeah. But Bill, we are drinking a vintage champagne. Any significance? How long can you save bottles before opening? A uh, great question, Bundaba, um, or should be excellent question. Uh, registered trademark. Um, so. Uh, champagne ages beautifully, um, and we talked briefly about that process where those champagne bottles are laid on their neck, and you know you do that, you know, kind of Pellegrino turning, um, but you don't spill as much, and then uh, you pop the cork and you add, you know, your sugar water or sugar wine or concentrated must from you know further south in France. But should be said that uh, disgorgement process is kind of like the beginning of the life of champagne. Before that. Champagne rests on the lees, and I'm going to answer two questions in once here because um, there are different requirements for vintage champagne. So uh, you've got your non-vintage champagne and your vintage champagne. Non-vintages uh, blend. It would be better uh, described as multiple vintage champagne. So there are uh, wines from multiple years in the mix, and people do that. They save reserve wines and add them to the pro product of one, um, you know, kind of year's harvest to ensure consistency uh, over time. And uh, Non-vintage champagnes are made in select years where that is not necessary. They're made in select years from the choicest parcels when growers say, you know, this, you know, particular uh, product is so special that, you know, we want to release something that speaks to, you know, this, you know, moment in time. Um, and we're going to do that through the aegis of vintage champagne. Now, there are requirements for the aging of vintage champagne. So by law, you have to lay a vintage champagne down for at least three years on the lees. So, you know, I showed you that sediment in the bottle earlier. You have to age the wine um, during the secondary fermentation process on the lees for at least three years uh, to declare a vintage on it. So that, you know, uh, musty yeastiness you get from champagne is a product of that autolysis, which is the product of, you know, the breaking down of those dead yeast cells, that little cell sediment. Over time, they produce all these chemical constituents that give you that funky, moldy, brioche um, toastiness uh, that people associate with champagne. And then additionally, once you start that clock um, and you have disgorged your champagne, you get additional aging processes and they erode the fruit in your wine. I think a lot of you tasting the Brune Severnier against the Gatinois will notice also that the Gatinois is much more fruity, whereas the Brune Severnier is, is, is brinier um, and, and you know, seemingly more savory. And, 
part of that has to do with the difference between Blanc de Noir and Blanc de Blanc, but part of that too has to do with the fact that the Brun Chevernet, those half bottles were actually disgorged in 2016. So they've had a little bit of time aging in a half bottle. And just like, you know, larger magnums um, uh, age more slowly than 750s, smaller bottles age at a faster clip. Uh, than 750s. Um, so, um, you know, you have, you know, little half bottles there, you know, that have a little bit of olive age to them uh, as well. And that gives you kind of a racier, more sherry-like, um, you know, kind of uh, affect than you could expect of uh, the wine uh, in, its, in its youth. But by law, to slap a vintage on the label, um, the houses have to rest their wines on the lees, um, said Sir Lee or Sir Lot. Um, uh, for a bare minimum of three years. Now, a lot of houses will vastly exceed that requirement for the sake of their vintage dated wines, but the longer you age a wine, the longer, um, you know, uh, it has to develop those funky cheese-like flavors, and the more it will taste just like the lees, and the less of a distinct kind of, um, you know, vineyard imprint uh, it will have. It will taste more like um, you know, the process of aging, then it will taste like, you know, its original self as it came off the press. If champagne sits on the lees, how is it not rosé if it's using Pinot? Um, it is not rosé because uh, it has derived, it has picked up none of the pigments from the skin. So that large basket press um, uh, allows the juice to bleed directly out of the grapes and not pick up any of the anthocyanins from the skin. So it's the pigments from the skins themselves that give you color in wine. Uh, the lees are very different. The lees are dead yeast cells um, in uh, the wine um, left over after the fermentation process. And um, those dead yeast cells don't really contribute any color um, to the wine. They just contribute this added perception of richness and weight uh, in, in the wine. So once Is you it start as Blanc de Noir, there's no going back. Is it true um, what people say, the smaller the bubbles, the higher the quality? Um, people do say that, Joan. Um, you know, I, I will say that uh, I, I, I don't know if that hasn't been my experience. I think the bubbles do get like bigger. It should be said as the as wines get sweeter um, because there's more surface tension for the sake of the bubbles. Um, I also find that, you know, um, the bubbles are bigger in wines that have more pressure. Um, and you know, that you know, you thing of, you know, how much pressure is the wine under um, changes bottle to bottle. You know, typically it's like six to eight atmospheres for the sake of a, a bottle of champagne, which is, you know, why that can be dangerous. And we'll get to that a little later um, when I embarrass myself for the sake of showing you how to, you know, open a champagne bottle in a really fun way. Um, but, um, you know, uh, wines that are bottled at lower pressure, you know, closer to four or even, you know, three atmospheres of pressure, which is more of like a Petion Natural, or some of you purchased um, the uh, G. Monet uh, Cuvée Gastronome, um, which is from the Blanc de Blanc, but bottled at a lower pressure, closer to four atmospheres. You know, typically you can expect a finer mousse uh, to that, so finer bubbles. So in my experience, it has more to do with uh, scientific factors and less to do with kind of the inherent quality uh, of the wine, uh, generally. Got it. Um, can you talk actually a little bit about mousse? Um, yeah, so mousse um, refers to the, um, uh, you know, is the, the French word um, for the head um, on, on a wine. Um, and it, it, you know, traditionally actually referred to beer and cream, you know, so the, the linguistically the French word, um, you know, uh, just referred to, you know, that, that broth, essentially, essentially meant, meant broth um, uh, more broadly. Uh, the French in actually invented a new word um, for the, the um, you know, froth on champagne. Uh, they appended a, a, a suffix um, to the mousse and it became mousseau. Um, so mousseau um, entered the French um, language in the 18th century with champagne um, and mousse became mousseau because it was like even more mousse. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, the mousse um, just refers to um, the, the effervescence and, and tasters will refer to the mousse as a sensation of the wine on the palate. Um, and, and you know, that is a biological sensation. Um, and actually there are, fascinatingly enough, there are um, uh, some um, drugs uh, that uh, people take um, when they um, are combating altitude sickness. Um, so you hear about um, mountain climbers uh, who are on this drug and it interferes with your um, uh, body's ability, the, you know, whatever the taste receptor is for CO2, um, it doesn't bind the same way. So there are all these mountain climbers who talk about 
being on this drug and uh, drinking champagne, you know, having summited and champagne tastes still to them um, because, you know, the biological mechanism is, is interfered with. Um, so it, it's, it's very much a tactical sense um, and it's pleasant, but, um, you know, it will also interfere with our perception of the wine itself. So, you know, sometimes I actually like to swirl a wine so that it loses some of its mousse to get a better sense of the base wine. And then there are um, sommeliers that will actually decant champagne, especially like really bone dry, you know, like older um, uh, champagnes um, that are really acid driven. People will decant. I, I don't, I don't prescribe to that notion. I'd rather pour it out into a glass um, and use the glass as a mini decanter. Um, it feels kind of like morally debased to, decant, to, to decant champagne, but um, it, it is, you know, worthwhile. And for a lot of these, you know, um, newer um, champagnes that are, you know, really, really dry, um, I do find that opening them the day before um, and not touching them and coming back to the button the next day, they will be much more expressive than they were the first day and you will not have lost um, any of the fizz. Um, do you have any thoughts on Dom Perignon? Uh, he's a fascinating character. He is hugely misunderstood historically. Um, it's a great wine. It's expensive. Um, you know, uh, I, I've had the pleasure to drink Tom, Dom P. Um, you know, I've had the, the pleasure to drink some other, you know, um, wines from luxury houses. Um, I had favors like Bollinger makes, you know, kick-ass wines. Heidsick at the higher end makes great wines. I have some like smaller houses, like Dutz is one of the old school grand marks that I think makes exceptional wines. Picard Samon, one of the few independently owned houses that makes, you know, in incredible wines. Um, you know, I, I have less beef with um, pairing on the product than I do with just this notion of wine as captive to um, a larger array of global market forces that also encompass handbags. That bothers me. Um, you know, uh, and, and, you know, trading in wine, um, you know, the same way you trade um, in, you know, diamonds and silk scarves, that bothers me, you know, that, that you know, um, unmoors it from its roots as a luxury good, as a, as a agricultural product, and it makes it, you know, uh, a commodity in, you know, the more cartoonish, you know, kind of uh, way that, you know, luxury brands are. Um, you know, that said, you know, like I mentioned in my mailer, you know, uh, you know, Jay, you know, Wheezy, nobody's rapping about Jacques Sun. you know, people rap about Cristal Dampi for a reason, um, you know, because they're, they're luxury signifiers. And, um, you know, with, um, you know, Dampi, um, Moet de Chandon have, has really, you know, um, cleverly attached their, uh, you know, uh, brand to this hugely influential figure who's, you know, equally misunderstood and, and, and fascinating. So Dom Perignon uh, deserves a lot of credit um, for making champagne what it is today. Um, he devised um, all sorts of uh, innovations, um, chiefly in the cellar, uh, that made uh, champagne um, a greater wine um, than it ever was before. Uh, things like pruning to favor quality, harvesting uh, early in the morning to ensure the acid on wines, harvesting in multiple passes to harvest the ripest grapes, uh, sorting in the vineyard, using smaller harvesting baskets so the grapes didn't get crushed. Um, he made some of the first Blanc de Noir, um, he was an kind of a, a um, kind of fierce guardian of quality um, in the cellar and a gifted uh, blender in his time. And his wines sold for 10 times um, uh, what the wines did, um, you know, uh, in other villages throughout the region. Um, what is missing from this list of achievements? Creating sparkling wine, tasting stars. He never tasted fucking stars. Um, you know, that never happened. Um, uh, Dom P um, was hired to ensure consistency, to remake um, uh, the Abbey of Old Villiers um, and uh, kind of replant their vineyards. Um, he replanted them and made great wines, uh, but the English made sparkling wines and the French weren't making sparkling wine at scale until the 19th century. And um, Moet Chandon, uh, you know, um, basically revised history uh, for the sake of, you know, their own marketing purposes um, and good on them. But, you know, I think it's important to understand that the true history of the wine uh, in the region. Um, if money were no object, what would you drink? What champagne would you drink? Uh, something old, uh, something historic. Um, people talk about, um, I actually like wines with these like amazing stories. So there's this amazing story of the vintage of uh, 1914. I actually don't think any of these wines are available anymore, but um, you're in the, in the middle of the Great War um, and uh, all the um, champagne, France, they lose tens of thousands of, of 
uh, soldiers in, in a given day. Champagne suffers catastrophic losses. Um, who harvests the grapes? Children. So literally, um, the children of the region are going into uh, the vineyard and harvesting. Um, and it just so happens that, you know, the wines they harvested over months uh, happens to be one of the greatest vintages of the century. Um, and, um, you know, well into the 60s, people were cracking these bottles and celebrating uh, this history um, and, and proclaiming their greatness. I don't know if any of them exist, exist anymore. Um, you know, for my sake, I'm trying to think of some of the greatest, you know, champagnes that I've had. Um, I, I don't know, some older, I've had some older stuff from the all from like Cedric Boucher's father um, that, you know, um, are super stunning. Um, I, I like, you know, we talked about old wine and the pleasures of drinking old wine. I, I like, you know, the death rattle of old, old wine, old champagne that spent just a ton of time, uh, you know, Sir Lot. Um, I, I like, you know, kind of the opulence of, you know, the V-marts of the world. But then I think the great thing about um, champagne is the sentimental, emotional attachment of it. So um, uh, this is, um, uh, John, I'm going to take more questions, but I have to embarrass myself first. So um, this comes from Jacqueson. Jacqueson is one of the Grand Marks. Um, uh, they buy some of their fruit, um, but they own about 80% of the grapes that go into their wine. Um, the house is currently presided over by Jean Hervé uh, um, and his brother Laurent uh, Chiquet. Um, you can see them. Uh, they're very uh, Gaelic uh, looking. It's, it's just, you know, uh, why the, the picture, you know, speaks a thousand words. They look like they uh, make wine uh, in, in Champagne. Um, uh, at any rate, um, they preside over this historic domain um, that began in 1789. Actually, Krug, more famous name, um, started as a uh, offshoot of Jacquesson when Johann Joseph Krug left uh, Jacquesson in 1843. Um, their forebearer invented the um, wire cage um, that goes on to uh, champagne stoppers. Um, fast forward, fascinatingly enough, and uh, the brothers Chique never stopped innovating, um, and they did away with vintage dated wines. They said that, um, you know, we do not want to strive for kind of this artificial consistency in our wines. We want to celebrate you know, um, one vintage to the next. Uh, but we still want to be able to reserve wines and, you know, plug in the holes. Um, you know, we still want to be able to blend. We still be, want to be able to, you know, correct for the deficiencies of an individual vineyard and also add complexity with older wines to the freshness of younger wines, um, you know. And so uh, what they did is they started assigning numbers um, to their wines beginning in 2003 with 728. Um, we are now on 743. Um, uh, I love this wine um, on its own because, you know, for me, it's very emblematic of, you know, this old story domain um, that is now, um, you know, kind of, uh, they're in the Val de Marne um, and they work with, um, you know, almost equal parts, roughly, mostly Chardonnay, actually 50% Chardonnay, but then equal parts, roughly um, Meunier and, and Pinot Noir. Um, and, you know, they're, they're fearless innovators. Um, they're very much part of this kind of newer wave of producers that works more largely in oak um, that, um, you know, uh, pushes the envelope in terms of dryness. Dryness. This is essentially non-dosé, and when people say non-dosé, they mean no, no dosage at all, um, no corrective um, liquor uh, ended, um, added at the end of the process. Um, and the wines are stunning, and they, they speak for themselves. Um, uh, this is equally special to me because um, uh, my wife and I um, uh, ordered this bottle um, when we uh, got engaged, um, and uh, we were um, you know, celebrating our engagement in Baltimore. Um, this is the wine we toasted it with. So, you know, not this very bottle as such, but, you know, um, champagne does that. Um, wine does that, but champagne in particular does that in a way that, you know, I can't think uh, of, you know, um, any other wine uh, doing uh, this, the same way. So, um, you know, I kind of want to toast to that uh, emotional resonance. And then, you know, I have some kind of like, uh, you know, deeper thoughts for the sake of uh, our, our current moment. I hope, you know, at the very least that, you know, I've given you a fuller appreciation of, you know, the uh, seminal um, kind of uh, history of, of Champagne and, you know, of, you know, the true story of uh, the people that, you know, made the wine into uh, what it is today. It is a very different history than is commonly taught um, in the trade press. But I, I like to think that, you know, uh, working a little harder, digging a little deeper gives us a fuller appreciation appreciation um, of what the wine is today. And, you know, I think about that in, in the context of, you know, MAGA, of Make America Great Again, because, you know, um, the whole uh, presumption here is that we were once great and no longer are, you know, which begs the question, you know, wherein lies our greatness, um, you know, as a nation, you know, 
Is it like Champagne tied to the myth of, you know, Dom P seeing stars? Or can we accept the fact that it was actually an aging widow with a German who made the wine uh, what it is today? There are all sorts of, you know, comparable analogies in American history. And, you know, uh, for me, you know, last night I looked at um, an African-American, Asian-American, um, you know, uh, second generation uh, immigrant uh, woman, um, you know, being, uh, you know, on the verge of the vice presidency. I looked at a Seamus Heaney quoting former stutterer, survivor of personal tragedy, um, ascending to the White House over uh, after, you know, over three decades of trying. And, you know, I can't help but think, you know, is that not uniquely American greatness? And, you know, I think it is, and I think it's equally worth toasting to. So uh, alone together, cheers to that. Everybody at home, salute. Joan, what else you got for us? I think that's actually mostly it, unless I've missed any glaring questions. You went over quite a few of them that I had, but if you have any questions, put them in the chat now and I'll get them to Bill. All right, so uh, this is the uh, grand finale. Um, I promise you all that I would embarrass myself. And um, I should say, first and foremost, um, if you decide to do this, uh, do not do it indoors. Um, I'm in a hermetically sealed pod um, and no one will be hurt. Uh, uh, you know, uh, when I, I carry out this fun experiment. But I want to give you the tools um, to creatively open wine uh, yourselves uh, at home. This is a bottle of champagne. It's a bottle of rosé champagne. We didn't cover rosé at all. It should be said that um, uh, rosé champagne is rosé, not because uh, the grapes have contact with the skins um, early on uh, and then are bled off, uh, but typically because you actually have red wine um, added, uh, you know, toward the end of the blending process. So in this case, uh, a wine from the Cote de Zizan, which we didn't cover at all, it's another sub-region, um, essentially a southern extension of the Cote d'Or. Um, and, you know, we could, um, you know, take the foil uh, off this bottle. And, you know, uh, when we do that, you know, obviously we want to be very careful. And should be said that, you know, when you begin this activity, you want to make sure that your bottle is ice, ice cold. Um, Andre 3000, what's cooler than being cool, ice cold. Um, cold. Um, so that's first and foremost, um, you know, uh, the organizing paradigm. Uh, then secondly, you want to look at your bottle. Now, uh, this is, um, you know, uh, the closest thing we have to English glass here. Um, and uh, English bottles, uh, modern bottles, they have a seam. Um, we need to look for that seam because it is going to be the weakest part on the bottle. So there's a seam that runs the length of the bottle. I don't know if you can see it here, uh, but you can certainly feel it and you'll be able to find it uh, on uh, your bottle at home. But the seam is what we are reaching for. Um, and then just to make this a little bit easier, I'm going to remove uh, the rest of the foil here um, so that I have a smooth surface over which to slide my opening vessel. Now, I am fully confident that this bottle is very cold because normally I wouldn't want to remove this cage, um, which the forebearers of Jackie Sun uh, added to the mix. I wouldn't want to do that um, and take my hand off. It normally should keep it on at all times. But for the sake of this exercise, um, I am going to uh, remove the cage um, and leave the cork uh, in the mix. And then um, I have a knife, uh, or imagine it as a saber, um, if you will. Um, and that is going to allow me to open this bottle um, seamlessly uh, without uh, the uh, aid of you know my wrist and my hand. And, uh, because it looks fucking cool. That's why we do this, if for no other reason. Um, now, uh, we're gonna aim for that seam and then we're going to aim for the point on the neck of the bottle where the seam meets. You got it right after the right stop. Uh, because it should be said uh, that is, um, and I, <laughs> I applaud the person that uh, uh, renamed themselves as it should be said, but um, at the very least, that is the weakest point on the bottle. And that's where we want to hit this at its weakest point. And what we're going to do is we're going to dispel the cork with the ring of the bottle. So the bottle will essentially break, but it will do so in a very clean way. So you will get a ring of glass around your cork and it will fly in a dramatic arc for your friends. And you'll do this outside and not inside. Um, and uh, all your friends uh, will, you know, uh, ring their applause. Uh, the knife is less important. You wanna use the blunt end and you wanna make sure that you don't tell your award-winning chef that you borrowed one of his knives to do so. That is a very important part of the process. And you wanna hope that he is on the line and not listening uh, when you do these things uh, as well. So I am uh, removing the cork here. 
And mind you, when you are opening at home, typically you want to leave your hand on the cork because, you know, at this point, you know, you are, you are flying, you know, blind and there's nothing to prevent this cork from flying off um, other than uh, my, my saber uh, here. So I'm going to uh, relocate um, my seam, which I've found, and then I'm going to show you our, hopefully, um, how the saber the bottle of okay. champagne. Three, two, and one. Oh, bah. Oh, and we got a little spilling, but I came prepared with towels for once. So, uh, cheers to you all um, at home. Uh, I will uh, send around a better video. Uh, it gives you a fuller sense of how to do that. Mr. Alton Brown, uh, at the very least, uh, has done it um, and uh, safely in an outdoor environment. Uh, but I hope you all have a lovely week. Thank you so much for celebrating with me. Um, Last here. question, Bill. Yeah, yeah. If, you, um, if you could, if Biden was a wine really? and Kamala was a wine, but Stephen, if you could mute, please. Oh, Biden and wine and Kamala wine. Well, obviously, obviously Biden, Biden has a little bottle age. Um, if you could mute uh, Stephen, Bill. Um, so it, it should be said that uh, Biden, Biden would definitely have a little bottle age. Um, uh, Delaware doesn't really make wine. Also, should be said, Biden doesn't drink. Um, Biden says there are enough alcoholics in his family. Um, Kamala loves wine. Um, uh, actually, Esther Mobley, who is an amazing uh, writer for the San Francisco Chronicle, um, has documented her, um, you know, kind of like going around to various wineries in Sonoma because she's like on the, like in the wine club and filling up her trunk and going away. So um, uh, Kamala is my best hope um, for a, uh, you know, own a file. Um, you know, kind of uh, at the upper uh, echelons of power. But if Biden was a wine, I think he would be, you know, something really like stately, um, you know, and classic, but, you know, maybe uh, not French. So I, I think like Biden could be like uh, an older uh, Rioja, but something classic, you know, like a, like a Lopez de Herrera, um, you know, you know, kind of wine, um, you know, something that, you know, uh, is, is, you know, strong and enduring. Um, you know, that, that lasts for, for decades uh, upon end, but, you know, it maybe isn't like, you know, the biggest, you know, most bombastic, you know, kind of powerhouse fruit forward kind of wine, you know, it's, it's, it's a little more, you know, uh, elegant and sinewy in the hopes of own right. And then uh, Kamala has to be something from uh, California. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I could see her like, you know, she has like the, you know, kind of like suave, you know, um, grace under pressure of like a Russian River Valley Pinot. Uh, but I don't, I don't know, I need to do more digging. I don't know what uh, Kamala herself likes to drink. Um, so I, I need to, you know, dive deeper, but I'm going with like Russian River Valley Pinot uh, for, um, you know, the vice president elect for, for the time being. But it's very exciting to, uh, you know, get to speculate on these things. So, you know, cheers to that. <laughs>